Think Forward. Think Research Channel. The opinions expressed in the following program are strictly those of the speaker. They do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. From the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin, this is Frontier, discussions of today's most exciting research subjects by distinguished scientists and engineers working at the frontiers of knowledge. BT is a nickname for a bacterium that's called Bacillus thuringiensis. And okay. this bacterium makes proteins that kill insects. And the great thing about them is that they're extremely toxic to certain insects, but cause little or no harm to almost everything else, including people and wildlife. When we first caught up with Bruce Tabashnik, head of entomology at the University of Arizona, he was studying the effects of Bt toxins on pests. Even before uh, Bt crops were widely grown, it was predicted that the bollworm might be the fastest to evolve resistance. Currently, he's working on a way to address the problem of certain pests, which have begun developing resistance to the bacterium. Insects have evolved resistance to virtually all insecticides that have been used against them. In these Bt crops, insects are exposed to the toxins constantly throughout the growing season. and when resistance strains were developed in the lab and the inheritance of resistance was studied, it turned out that in bollworm, if one of the two parents is resistant, then the offspring are resistant. It's called dominant inheritance of resistance. In most of the other insects studied so far, the inheritance of resistance is recessive. That's like blue eyes. It means you have to get the gene from both parents. And so in those cases where it's recessive, the resistance is expected to evolve more slowly, and that's just exactly the way it's turned out so far. Part of the study was to take the information from the scientific literature on the biology of each of six major pests that are targeted by Bt crops around the world, plug that information into a computer model, and come up with projections of how quickly each pest would evolve resistance. And based on those projections, the bollworm was expected to evolve resistance first. And again, that matches exactly with what happened in the field. Where there are lots of other crops that the bollworm eats, besides cotton, it has not evolved resistance. So this is part of the evidence that confirms the refuge theory. That is, if the insects have plants to eat that don't make Bt toxin, then they'll evolve resistance more slowly. So if they have a mixture of plants with Bt toxins and without, the plants without are called a refuge, and the more of those you have, the slower resistance is expected to evolve. So that's a second prediction that was confirmed by the field evidence, that in states or in areas where there was a high proportion of Bt cotton making up the insect's diet, the bollworm's diet, resistance evolved faster than where there was other crops, refuges, that the insects could eat where they weren't being exposed to Bt toxin. I'd like to begin by showing you a 16-minute videotape. So we've begun a film about this project, and my question is, how should we finish it? In other words, one way to do this would be to aim for a sort of Discovery Channel PBS audience. The other alternative is to pitch it as a teaching film. Then the second half, I'll, I'll walk you through some PowerPoints to show you how far we've got, and that would be sort of the second half of the film, if you will. So the question is uh, how to uh, put those two pieces together. So without further ado, let me show you the first part of this film. My name is Steve Lansing. I'm an anthropologist, and I've been studying the cultures of Indonesia since 1971. 
I began on the island of Bali, investigating the role of water temples. This is the temple Pura Ulundanao, located in a crater lake in the extinct volcano of Badugu in central Bali. I've also worked on other islands like Nias, where there's a very different kind of society. The village of Bamataluo, South Nias, is one of the most interesting tribal villages in the world because this is a tribal society on the verge of transforming itself into a civilization. These people were headhunters and their organization was tribal, based on kinship. But they were able to organize hundreds, even thousands of people to drag these giant stone blocks up to the top of this hill, several hundred meters up, and execute the sort of fine stonework that you see on the side. But who were the ancestors of the Indonesian people? And why are their cultures so different from one island to the next? I've been wondering about those questions since my first visit. To understand the flowering of cultures in these islands, we need to begin at the beginning. The last great prehistoric migration of humans into pristine environments was into the Pacific. The first colonists reached Australia and New Guinea about 60,000 years ago. But these were hunter-gatherers who lived off the land. Some of the islands could not be reached until people learned how to build sailing canoes and grow their own food. So there had to be a second wave of colonization. Many anthropologists think that it started in China. By about 6,000 years ago, the knowledge of how to grow rice and build villages reached the island of Taiwan. These people became the ancestors of what we now call the Austronesians. Some Austronesians sailed south to the Philippines, reaching the islands of Indonesia and the coast of New Guinea by 3,500 years ago. 300 years later, they were in Fiji and Hawaii by around 500 AD. This theory fits the archaeological data, but recent results from genetic studies have raised new questions. A better understanding of the origins of the Indonesian people is important not only because people want to know where they came from, but because it can help with the treatment of disease. For example, one of the serious diseases in the tropics is a liver infection caused by the hepatitis B virus. There's no cure, but a vaccine can prevent the disease. But which islanders need the vaccine? There are thousands of inhabited islands in Indonesia and limited medical resources. A few years ago, the Indonesian government restored an old colonial hospital as a center for genetic research. They named it for Christian Eichmann, a Dutch doctor who received the Nobel Prize for discovering the first vitamin. The executive director of the institute is Dr. Harawati Sudoyo, a geneticist and medical doctor. Hera and her research team have begun looking into the geographic patterns of disease in the archipelago. They discovered that one of the genetic variants for hepatitis B appears to follow the route of the Austronesian migration into the islands of Indonesia. But much more research needs to be done. In 2005, Hera asked me to join her on a research trip to Sumba, one of the poorest and most remote islands in the archipelago. Whenever they go to the field, Hera and her team coordinate with local public health clinics. But medical resources are limited, and the clinics have to prioritize. We're headed for the village of Mamboro on the north coast. We're also thinking about how to explain what we're doing to the local people. As well as hepatitis, we're interested in the local dynamics of other diseases, like diabetes and malaria. Last night, a public health nurse came on his motorcycle to invite the people of the village to gather in one of the clan houses. Dan uh, itu adalah Profesor Stephen Lansing, uh, orang setengah Bali dia, karena sudah lama sekali ada di Bali, jadi bisa berbicara bahasa Indonesia di asal Amerika. Um, maksud kami ke sini adalah sebenarnya untuk meneliti dan kemudian juga memeriksa beberapa penyebab dari penyakit malaria. Tapi bukan dari malarianya sendiri, tetapi dari kitanya sendiri, kenapa kok sebagian ada yang sering kena malaria, sebagian lagi tidak. Misalnya saya dari Jawa Timur, beda, beda apanya ya, orang Jawa itu banyak sekali yang sakitnya misalnya sakit gula, 
sakit gulanya sebabnya ini gitu jadi kita cepat tahu kalau oh kalau uh, saya tanya bapak dari mana Jawa sakit gula oh kalau gitu saya udah tahu yang mana yang saya harus periksa bapak orang apa Sumba Sumba daerah mana Barat Timur saya cepat tahu jadi ini gunanya untuk me, uh, menetapkan penyakit dengan cepat sebenarnya itu Hera wants to make sure that the people understand why we're asking them about their ancestry. So she asks if there are any questions. Tapi mungkin juga kadang-kadang di atas itu ada yang menikah antara misalnya orang Wanokaka dengan misalnya orang Sabu atau Wanokaka dengan uh, Loli. Jadi kita tahu isunya bahwa hasilnya nanti Oh, kita kalau dia agak beda, oh ini rupanya loli tadinya gitu. Jadi We're concerned that if it became known that someone has a hereditary disease, they or their family could be stigmatized. So Hera explains that the results of each person's screening exam will be given to them in private by the public health nurses. Everyone needs to understand and decide if they want to give their consent. Nah, di, di formulir yang terakhir itu bapak-bapak diminta untuk menyatakan persetujuannya. Jadi bahwa saya memang bersedia diambil darah untuk diperiksa dan saya bersedia juga mendapat hasilnya. Gitu. Jadi e, bisa tanda tangan bapak atau juga bisa cap jempol. Tiga. One of the first results from the Eichmann lab was the discovery that one of the genetic variants of hepatitis B is widespread among the descendants of the Austronesian voyagers. But on Sumba, these descendants are in the minority. They're clumped together in just a few villages. Sumbanese villages have a very distinctive style. In the center of each village, there are stone slabs that anthropologists call megaliths, burial places for distinguished ancestors. Surrounding the megaliths are tall, thatched houses for the clans. Sumba is located in one of the more remote regions of Indonesia, far to the east. About 1,500 miles to the west, at the other extreme edge of the archipelago, there's another island where the villages look very similar. This is Nias. Could this style of village architecture be a signature of the Austronesian expansion? Or is it just a coincidence? We took DNA samples from 108 men in two Nias villages and discovered that all of them, 100%, show the same pattern on their Y chromosome as the Austronesian descendants on Sumba. So all of the men on Nias and a fraction of the men on Sumba share a common Austronesian heritage. The villages and megaliths on Nias look something like the ones on Sumba, only bigger. I had already done some research in Nias in the 1980s. In fact, it was the similarities between Nias and Sumba that first got me thinking about this project. The upright stones are male symbols, symbols of high chief, but the stone benches are seats for the ghosts of the ancestors who come to participate in the great pig feast. These pictures were taken around 1907. They show giant blocks of stone which were dragged for miles through the forests and pulled up to the hilltop villages where they were carved into monuments for the chiefs and the gods. In Nias, young men have found an unusual use for their megaliths, something that doesn't happen on Sumba. But Nias is atypical. It's very unusual for a whole population of men to be descended from a single male ancestor. We think it means that this island was uninhabited until the Austronesians arrived in their sailing canoes. Where else did the Austronesians go? Flores is the next large island to the north of Sumba. The villages here resemble those in Sumba and Nias, so we decided to take a look. We've reached a village called Bena in Ngada, which is in central Flores, and it may be the most interesting place for our study. The village right behind me is, looks like a very typical Austronesian old village. It, it could almost exist in the island of Sumba. So one of the questions that we've got is, are they connected? I mean, how old are these villages? Were they settled by the same people at more or less the same time? What are the connections between these communities way up in the mountains of Flores and uh, on the island of Sumba? This village of Bena in the mountains of central Flores looks a lot like the villages in Sumba. We've got the houses with the tall thatched roofs and the stone tombs to the ancestors just in front of them. But there's an important difference. 
The villages in Sumba are patrilineal, the men are in charge, whereas here this village is matrilineal. It means that the houses are owned by women, that both men and women inherit their right to property through their mothers, and so the, the matriline is stronger here. The question we want to ask is, what difference does it make? Biasanya, Bapak, kalau uh, yang diturunkan berdasarkan ibu, yeah. itu warisan biasanya diberikan lebih banyak kepada anak perempuan. Yeah. Nah, apakah di sini juga terjadi hal seperti itu? Yeah. Ya, memang ini sudah turun temurun sejak dari kami punya orang tua. Yeah. Tapi yang terangkan adalah perempuan, sedangkan bagaimana perempuan itu untuk pengeluaran atau omong apa-apa, kita harus... In Bena, women have a lot of power. It's one of a handful of matrilineal villages where women own things like livestock and land. But these matrilineal villages are quite isolated. They're surrounded by cultures where men inherit power and wealth. We're on our way to one of those villages, a place called Soa, to meet a young doctor. Nama saya Dr. Paulina Hendrina Helena Peletini. Saya bekerja sebagai dokter PTT dua tahun di tempat ini. Sekarang sudah satu tahun saya bekerja di sini. The reason we're here is the village of um, people who trace their descent through the patriline, very close to the two villages that we've already studied, which trace descent matrilineally. So we've been trying to ask some questions to the people here, get some impressions about what difference it makes if you are born as a woman into this village or into the one in which uh, descendants trace through the mother. Misalnya, mama ketemu sama orang bejawa, perempuan juga orang bejawa, terus kita tidak baku bicara tentang hal itu, mengungkapkan perasaan lah, berbagi perasaan tentang hal itu. Kalau antara ibu dengan ibu ketemu, biasanya tanya, bertanya, mengapa ya tradisi itu itu berbeda dengan orang bejawa. Itu biasanya bilang ya itulah perbedaan, karena tradisi terbawa terus. Tetapi ada ibu yang berontak, mengatakan, ah tidak kita mesti galangkan itu. Tidak boleh kita wariskan kepada anak-anak itu demikian. Jadi wanita dan laki-laki itu segera aja. Hmm. Ya, maksudnya sekarang anaknya mama semuanya cari jodoh sendiri. Tidak dijodohkan kayak ya, mama. Lalu, 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 itu anak. Bisa. Aku, lai. Anak lai. Ya, sendiri cari sendiri. Waktu masih muda, mama dijodohkan. Tapi sekarang dia punya anak-anak, semua sudah cari jodoh sendiri. Mas saya tidak dijodohkan, mereka cari calon sendiri. Terus kalau mereka sudah dapat calon, mereka kasih tahu mama supaya mama mama masuk minta. Masih, masih, masih. Masih, masih. Di sini jodohnya pakai syarat. Ada soa budaya soa. Di sini ada syarat. Anaknya. Mencari jodoh tapi punya syarat. Kalau beli, kalau sudah suka sama suka, terus lapor sama orang tua, terus yang tadi dijelaskan sama bapa. Bilang kalau dari keluarga keluarga laki-laki nanti bawa kuda, kambing, ayam, kerbau, terus nanti dibalas dari pihak dari pihak perempuan bawa beras, kain, babi. Change is coming to some of the islands. But customs like patrilineal kinship have deep roots. But why are things so different from one island and one region to the next? Until now, anthropologists have mostly been content simply to describe these differences. But in the last 10 years or so, we've been given some new tools that allow us to look much more closely into the past. So we're looking at the relationship between genetics and historical linguistics, which sounds complicated, but actually it's pretty simple. On the genetic side, we're looking at little things called microsatellites. So in every little region of DNA that exists, there are things called microsatellites. These are bits of genetic code that appear to have no functional significance. So they're free to mutate, and mutate they do. The number of microsatellites that differ between one person and another is an index of how closely related they are. So the microsatellites are like a little molecular clock that tells us how far back a given pair of people share a common ancestor. And we can push that all the way back for thousands of years if we need to. So on the genetic side, we can use these microsatellites to gauge the relatedness of people within a village or between villages, in one island or between islands. 
Before we started looking at microsatellites, the story of origins looked pretty simple. The Austronesians sailed down and colonized the islands. But when we looked at the Y chromosomes of Sumbanese men, we found that only a small fraction come from Taiwan. The other lineages are much older. So it looks like small numbers of Austronesian colonists landed their canoes on an island that was already populated. The Austronesians could have spread out from a single village somewhere on the north coast. So we're in the village of Wunga in northeastern Sumba, near the beach, and the Sumanese believe that this is the place of origin of all the clans. Most of these houses are empty most of the year, but every year in the month, the seventh month of the Sumanese calendar, people come back to worship their ancestors at these, at these um, ancestral houses. So their myth of origin comes pretty close to what we think is going on from the standpoint of genetics, that is, there was an initial migration here, and then after that, clans would have formed and moved out across the landscape, settling in the most desirable areas. So the real question that we're trying to investigate here is the literal truth behind the legends of Sumbanese origins. Here's Wunga on the north coast, the driest piece of land in all of Indonesia. The Austronesian colonists brought their genes and their languages with them. When we started this research, it was thought that the Austronesians moved out in a great wave replacing or blending with the people who were there before. But our new data tell a different story. Austronesian genes are found in small clumps, and the same is true of their languages. Today, some villages have retained a lot of Austronesian words in their local dialect, but others have not. So here is what we think might have happened. Sumba was already populated by hunter-gatherers. They would have been concentrated in the west, where there is more rainfall. The Austronesians arrive, build their village, and as their population grows, begin to create new villages. The villages in the west would have been surrounded by indigenous people speaking different languages. As the two groups intermarried, the proportion of Austronesian words and genes would gradually fall off. But in the east, the Austronesian villages would have been more isolated and retained more of their original genes and language. So that's the start of this film. <laughs> now I'll tell you what we think we've figured out so far. As many of you know, anthropologists have been taking advantage of the work of uh, geneticists like Kamali Sforza for years to trace things like the migration histories of people. Well, we're beginning to look now at anthropological models to explain why things happened in the way they did. So it's a different question. It's not so much the statistical models of understanding genetic uh, structure, but rather what kinds of underlying community scale processes could have produced the results that we see in the genetic and the linguistic records. So I'll talk about three models quickly. The first of them, I'll just finish the story that we began in Sumba on linguistic speciation. Uh, then village assembly, how villages get put together and how related people are and how persistent are the patterns through time. And then the relationship between language and genetics, which is a good question even if we haven't got clear answers. So here we are back again on Sumba. So there's the island. Our linguists classified the languages of Sumba into five groups based on a, uh, oh, it took him months, and so those are A, B, C, D, and E. Here also you see the genetic haplotypes. So O is the signature, it's common among Taiwanese aboriginal signature. We think of Austronesian migration from Taiwan, that original animation. Uh, C, K, and M are older. Uh, C is very, you know, is common in, uh, in Australia, for example. So here we have this distribution of languages and, uh, and of genes. And um, here, sort of graphically, this is how many, if you take a, a list of 200 identical words, a Swadesh word list, and you calculate how many of them are of Austronesian origin, then these, which is group E, has retained a lot more of those Austronesian words than group D, C, B, or A. So <laughs> there's been a, we think, a decline, you know, kind of decay in the Austronesian signature through time. And we see a similar relationship here then with Austronesian DNA, meaning the O haplogroup. So lo and behold, to our surprise, 3,000 or so years later, we continue to see a signal, a structural relationship between the genetic and the linguistic components of the Austronesian heritage. That surprised us because, I mean, Mike Hammer, with whom I work, the geneticist, said we look for these things on continental scales, not islands 200 kilometers across. But uh, nonetheless, there it is. So the question is how to understand it. Um, in order to do that, we have to work backwards in time and try to understand what happened 
in prehistory, in the absence of archaeology, we can do some tricks with the genetics. So we can ask, take two villages at the opposite ends of the island and do a Monte Carlo Markov chain coalescence simulation. I'll explain that to anybody who's interested afterwards and get a date for their divergence. When did this population split and form these villages? We actually think that it happened more recently. One of my colleagues, uh, Joe Watkins, the mathematician, has been coming up with new models to work out the rate of microsatellite mutations. So anyway, th the date's probably more like 3,000 years, if Joe is right. And that's consistent then. Roughly 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, sounds about right for the time at which we think those Austronesians got there. So first conclusion is that we can see some structure at the scale of communities in terms of language and genetics. And on thinking about it, that makes sense because in the end, language change and genetic change is going to be a local phenomenon happening at the scale of communities. So we're encouraged to think, let's build models of what we think is going on at the local scale and then see how those things will scale up to higher level patterns. So the next question was, how then do we deal with language? Here is the tree of Proto-Sumba, painstakingly reconstructed uh, by Peter Norquist in our linguistics department, the University of Arizona. We have samples from 417 languages. That's only some of them. So we haven't got enough linguists to do that kind of work for all those languages. So of course we turn to computers. So there's a method called uh, Align, Greg Kondrak created, and we've been tweaking that. It's jokingly referred to as kind of a linguist in a box. So it's, a, it's just a mechanical method in which we decompose words into their features and then use the sum, a small subset of, of, of linguistic rules about how phonetic change occurs so that we can normalize scores to compare these words. And the idea is how divergent are two languages based upon the differences in features between, uh, between the 200 words that we have in our sample. So how well does that do? Well, here's the phylogeny that's constructed with a line. And here we have Peter's tree and the align tree. So not quite 90% similarity. So this is not good enough for some <laughs> linguistic purposes, but from our purposes, it's pretty good. It means we can, we can now cope with these very large numbers of languages and make some sort of broad scale comparisons about things like how fast do language, languages, if I may use the word decay, how fast do things change, how much do they move. So, so with this, we can then code res resemblances. Here's, here's just shading uh, Eastern Flores, uh, Limbata, and Alur. Alor is a region that has both Papuan languages and genes, so it's very different from Austronesian, and we see that very clearly as we simply shade the map, right, with the, with the correspondence between these language groups. So we get a basic foundation to make comparisons. And what we find is that there is a lot of variation at small scales. This is diversity of languages by distances between them, pairwise distances. So languages that are very close to each other, villages that are close, can be very similar, or they can be really very different. But as you go further out, you can imagine sort of scaling out to the island scale, then it becomes a much more regular kind of a, of a relationship. Next question then is, how does that kind of pattern compare with the genetic diversity? Again, the story here is that it's not a simple expansion of the O haplogroup, the Austronesians. The video that I showed you at the beginning, the voyage down from Taiwan, doesn't explain this. So, there were already people in place, and the question is, it's, it's a little more complicated picture of understanding how those populations came into existence and how they interacted. So on to the microsatellites. Okay, so microsatellites. We have used, geneticists have used things called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, to track migration. So you can send in your cheek swab to gene tree or different places, and they'll tell you where your patrilineal ancestors came from. Uh, those things mutate very slowly, so uh, you can tell, you know, what part of the world your ancestors came from thousands of years ago. But um, that doesn't tell us a lot about recent events. So we're interested in how communities are assembled. In other words, when a new village comes into existence, does, do the men in one patriline decide that they've had enough of that village and form a new village? Does everybody in the whole village send a son or a daughter? What, is there any kind of regularity in the processes by which villages come into existence? When they do come into existence, do they you know, how often do they ex accept immigrants from elsewhere? How isolated are they? And we think that there's going to be some relationship between the genetic isolation, so we say prehistoric hanky-panky patterns, right? And the, and the um, linguistic features. Can, you're less likely, probably, at least we hope, to uh, mate with people you can't talk to. So there's going to be some relationship there, and that's what we're trying to figure out. So we look then at the microsatellites. 
And those will tell you things that happened in the time scale of centuries even, or thousands of years. And in fact, the more recent those events, the more accurate the models that one can construct. So you just say, how many mutational steps in the microsatellites that you're looking at uh, distinguish you from someone else? And so you can simply count those up, and the more divergence there is, then the less closely related you are. So it's just a clock, as far as we're concerned. Uh, and this will then generate patterns, right? So if, whoops, back, if words or genes move quickly between communities, so there's a metapopulation and things kind of move around, there's some mixture, then you're going to get a pattern like this in which there'll be lots of rare genetic haplotypes, single new patterns, because they will be continually replenished as people move in from else elsewhere, and the, uh, the process of genetic drift is going to increase uh, those more rapidly if you um, create reproductive isolation. So imagine if instead each community becomes isolated, they don't accept immigrants, then rare ones are going to be pulled out by genetic drift, and the smaller the community, the more rapidly drift is going to reduce them. So in the end, you'll get a picture like that, right? Fewer rare ones. So that's the basic process. Here's some data. This is Cody, one of the villages in the island of Sumba. So we sampled 43 men. And uh, so how do you interpret this? Well, let's see. Here are the haplogroups. These are the major genetic groups. So O means the Taiwanese. These are each unique individual haplotype. So one man has a particular, here's an O haplotype. Another guy has a different O haplotype. This person has a unique K haplotype. And then we have nine different C haplotypes. Are you with me? So there's lots of diversity. These people are not closely related. On the other hand, over here, we've got one haplotype that is shared by 43 men. So there's a patriline, right? There's a group of people who are closely related through the male line. So the point is that these guys would not be abundant if patrilines favored their sons or kept out immigrants. Then you wouldn't see this kind of diversity. You'd see lots of the same haplotype, right? So what's the data look like? Well, here it is. 50 villages we've got so far. Look at these patterns. I couldn't get them all on there. None of them are at equilibrium, it looks like. And they all show lots of unique recent immigrants, diversity here. And every now and then, where are we? Every now and then you see one group that is dominant. So this village has maybe half of them belong to one patriline. The rest of them are all mixed up. How can we explain this? OK, so selection, if there were a tendency to favor members of your patriline, would lead to this kind of dominance. One patriline, I mean, that's what I thought would happen. One, each a new village consists of uh, you know, a community formed by by colonizers who come out from one group, right? Brothers forming a new village. That's what that kind of pattern would look like if the brothers stayed put and didn't let any, anybody else into their village. So we try the simulation. And what we do is just vary the amount of, uh, if you like, the skew, the reproductive skew. Is if you allow a patriline to favor its members from 0 to 5%, what happens is you reduce the number of haplotypes down to 1. Right? In the end, you only get 1. And that happens very quickly with 3, 4, 5 percent selection bias. Not a very strong selection bias. So in other words, within a couple thousand years, you would eliminate the genetic diversity. All those single diversity uh, singletons would disappear. So any level, almost any level of selection is inconsistent with the actual diversity that we see in these villages. So. To what do we turn? Well, the neutral theory, which began with Kimura in Genetics 68, and then picked up more recently by Steve Hubble and turned into the unified neutral theory of biodiversity in uh, ecology, uses the same equation to calculate the effects of neutrality, meaning remove, remove selection and simply look at what's the balance between drift pulling out novelty and mutation pushing it in, creating new, and or maybe some dispersal. So here's a simulation in which, here's the real data. So here we start with, um, this is going to, this will have started with one haplotype. Here's the population, and then here's our sample. So what we're doing is simulating the proportion through time, or the frequency of each of these haplotypes, both in the population. This is what you should compare that picture with. That's the real one. So in other words, you start with one haplotype, and then as time goes on, mutation will create new ones. 
a microsatellite will go ping, and you'll get a new microsatellite and a new haplotype. That'll happen fairly rapidly, and so you reach a new stochastic equilibrium in which you get a picture that looks like that. Point here is that's a neutral process. No selection is required. So that's starting with um, the scenario I was suggesting. One group of brothers creates a village. Pretty soon you get diversity. Here we start with 200 different haplotypes, and you'll see that we reach the same characteristic pattern quite rapidly. In other words, drift removes unique haplotypes, and pretty soon you get down to the same equilibrium. This is the number of haplotypes, roughly 45, that you'll find in stochastic equilibrium for the population, and here we are for the village, for the sampled group that we've looked at. So the point here is that a neutral model, rather than selection, explains this data. Um, what we get is a very rapid approach to this stochastic equilibrium over many simulations. Whether you start with one haplotype and breed up more, or start with lots of them and uh, allow them to decline, either way, that's the picture, and that's what we see in 50 out of 50 villages. So there's one for the neutral theory. Um, we then did the UN's exact test, and 39 of the 50 villages, so actually strict selective neutrality, they are genetically neutral. Uh, any selection effects turn out to be hard to find. The reason I'm em emphasizing this is many of my fellow anthropologists have uh, devoted a lot of time in the field called behavioral ecology to understand the role of selection in uh, all kinds of aspects of human behavior. Here what we're doing is saying if there was any kind of reproductive skew in favor of patrilines, you would weed out the genetic diversity that we see. In other words, we're, we're not seeing the, the kinds of things that a uh, that uh, behavioral ecologists are likely to imagine happening in human populations as a result of reproductive skew. The other thing is actually technically is that the, the non-neutral cases can also be the consequence of population bottle, bottlenecks. So it raises some questions. This is the first time, as far as I know, that anybody has actually tested the, the predictions of reproductive skew on actual genetic populations. We're looking at the actual observed genetic diversity. So. Um, the point then is there's lots of ancient diversity. These are the coalescent times, meaning the formation times of the various lineages that are dominant in this region. So they go back, here we are, roughly the 29 to 35,000 years. If selection were strong, that diversity would not persist. Imagine that these are small communities, small villages in which selection, I mean, drift is pulling out rarities rapidly. These populations were nucleated in small groups where drift would have been rapid. So uh, consistent then we think this is evidence for a neutral model applying to these human communities. One other thing we notice is that um, this coalescent method shows us an expansion of these populations. And once again, you'll see that they all, these are the dates. So 5,000, 4,300, 2,190, they all fall within roughly three to 6,000 years ago, which is, the date we think the Neolithic occurred in the region. So it is consistent with the idea that the, the transition from the Paleolithic world of hunter-gatherers to Neolithic farming happened in that window. That's consistent with all of the genetic data that we've got so far. So that's our second conclusion. Uh, the first, again, was that we saw structure at the community scale, right? The second is that the diversity of patrilines is consistent with selective neutrality not with patrilines aggressively protecting their territories and their, you know, keeping their villages to themselves. So the next question for us then was, what's the relationship of language, back to that, to the, popu to the, to the social world, if you like, to the affected population size, meaning the kind of community within which people intermarried? So that turns out to be interestingly variable. Here's the data we've got so far. The affected population size, the dimensions of the social world vary from, from about 30 and 40, actually quite small, on up to 1,700. So there's a lot of diversity. This would be a world consisting of small villages. This means a larger community. If the villages are only a few hundred people, then by the time we're up here, we're talking about a breeding community or a you know, gene flow occurring in larger communities than sim simply single villages. So what's up? Well, uh, we can calculate the effects of migration so here's a community of 100 individuals. As we increase the migration rate, this would be one migrant per generation to our little village of 100 people, 
then we bump up to about 150 for our effective population size. If we get up to five people for a generation, then the effective population size goes to 250. So you can picture villages that are not completely isolated, but are kind of exchanging. They're moving around a little bit, and the question is, how large is the scale of that world in which, there, in which there's some fluidity, some population movement? So that's just the basic calculation. What could account for the expansion of the human world beyond the scale of the village? Well, language seems like the you know, first obvious question to ask. So in general, there's this simple relationship that um, diversity increases with distance. But the size of the language community is larger than a single village, right? So there is, you know, clearly language is going to expand the social world uh, beyond the scale of the village. However, as we look at the actual data, there's lots of diversity from one island to the next. Alor is the village that is Papuan. So it's a very different language family, much older population. It's the one furthest out in my little simulations. So Alor is very different. These are small islands. Anyway, we can make up a story about each of these villages. Clearly, there's a language is more complicated. There's going to be a lot of diversity that we need to think about with respect to the uh, scale of language use, right? The scale of the language community. Here's uh, a language map based on our model, our aligned diversity for Celebes, for Sulawesi. So you can see, you know, we're, we'll see the structure there, basically. What I'm suggesting is we see structure related to both migration history, but also the continuing relationships between people and words through time. The final slide is not going to be the answer to this, by the way. We just got to the point where we're able to pose the question. So, so the next step for us is to, to try to do for the microsatellites, for the genetic variation, what we are beginning to do for the language, namely understand patterns emerging through space and time. So we built a model with an earlier NSF grant, biocomplexity, called SAIL, Simulated Agents in Love. So simulated agents in love, you, you create populations of agents, you allow them to have their will with each other and then track them through time. You can allow them to create daughter settlements. The colors are different microsatellites. This is time going this way. And in the end, you can say, okay, well, what kind of genetic diversity will we, will we see in these populations? And then that can be compared to the coalescent methods the geneticists use to work backwards in time and try to see from a given genetic structure what is the rate of population, you know, the process by which you re reach back to common ancestors. So we can go forward and backward in time and try then to get a better handle on these two to 3,000 year old uh, events in the small communities. So I'm about to conclude. Uh, what, what then, you know, what's the next step? Well, in order to do any of these MCMC coalescent methods, you, it's, they're hugely expensive for computational time. But fortunately, the National Science Foundation allows us to connect to the teragrid of supercomputers. So we're building the, doing what's necessary to make it possible to run these coalescent models backward in time for all of our data and get a handle. Clearly, in other words, the point is clearly from one island to the next, we're getting quite different histories of languages and genes. So we want to be able to build models, simulate backwards, and see if we can understand the reasons for that diversity. So TerraGrid should help us understand the origins, you know, where things came from, and then test this selection versus neutrality issue. And then finally, we can look at the language speciation, look at the rates at which the languages change. What, the way we're thinking about this is in terms of the neutral theory, you know, languages of a certain size having words coming in and from other languages and then new words being constructed, just like mutation and, and uh, dispersal. So how far can we get with that simple model to understand the scale at which languages change and how much? Anyway, so that's one question. So that's TerraGrid. The other thing is to add, we actually have data, mitochondrial data, done by our Indonesian colleagues and autosomal markers, so we can now do linkages to see how does the Y chromosome, there's a lot more than one can, one can do now to refine the genetic methods and also to distinguish between the patrolines and the matrolines uh, with this additional data. So that's just a question of doing it. And then finally, we, we've got this region well sampled and here and a little bit over there, but this Sumatra and Borneo, we've barely begun. So if we're actually going to get an answer to this, we need to uh, continue the sampling so we get a picture, so we can fill in the picture and then test our models. We think that the language models will have to pay attention to scale 
in ways that the genetic models will not, because the genetic models, the genetic processes really happen at the community scale, whereas language is more mysterious. It's happening at, at different scales. So that's my story. These are my colleagues, Mike Hammer and his group at the University of Arizona, Tanya Karapet, a couple of mathematicians, Joe Watkins and Brian Hallmark, uh, the linguists and anthropologists, and the video was done by Ashley Stennett. Thank you very much. Think Forward. Think Research Channel.